Welcome to this rapid revision video on the Spanish Armada. It could be a little bit longer this one here because we're going to be looking at a lot of things. We're going to start with the preparations on each side, then we're going to have a look at the events of the Armada itself, and then we'll have a look at why it failed for the Spanish, and finally consider the outcomes for both England and for Spain. So without further ado, let's get into it. Why invade England in the first place? Well, the first reason is religion. Philip II of Spain saw Protestants as heretics, who had to be defeated. He was backed by the Pope, who had excommunicated Elizabeth in 1570. He also promised forgiveness for all sins for anyone taking part in an invasion against Elizabeth's England. There had been Catholic plots against Elizabeth before, and these had often been backed by Philip II. The next is politics and power. Spain was a powerful empire, far more powerful than England. However, England would be a useful addition to Spain's empire. Philip had co-ruled England in the time of Mary I, so perhaps he had got used to it. The Treaty of Dranville had allied Spain with Catholic France. The Treaty of Nonsuch sided England with the Dutch Protestants against Spain. Also, we can say that Philip was, in fairness, provoked. English ships had raided Spanish settlements and ships in the New World, and privateering by Drake and others had been seen as an act of war, probably understandably. This was made worse by the raid on Cadiz in 1587. Elizabeth had also sent troops to the Netherlands to fight the Duke of Parma's army. And the last was that simply the timing was right. The circumstances at this time were right for the Spanish. Spain had acquired Portugal and its naval resources in 1580. The Duke of Parma had also been winning in the Netherlands since 1579, with England only able to slow him and not stop him. Elizabeth's hesitancy and willingness to negotiate was seen correctly as a sign of English weakness against Spain. And so Philip ordered the Armada to set sail. Let's consider the Spanish preparations. Amphibious invasions have always been some of the most dangerous military operations, going right the way back to the Norman Conquest, or in modern times with things like the D-Day landings. So Spain was determined to be formidably prepared. The Armada was the most powerful fleet ever seen in Europe. It consisted of 130 ships, mostly large galleons with guns and a large troop transport capacity, and a capacity for lots of supplies too. They were taking 2,431 cannons, both for fighting at sea and for fighting on land once the army arrived to invade England. 30,000 men were prepared. 27,000 of these would be transported from the Netherlands to Kent to take London and depose Elizabeth. They would need to be carried by the Armada to get there, so the other 3,000 men are the ones manning the ships. The Duke of Medina Sidonia commanded the Armada, but he was not an experienced naval commander, more of a land-based commander. And then there was the Duke of Parma. He would command the land forces, linking up with the Armada in the Netherlands before embarking to invade England. So that's the plan. Bring the Armada to the Netherlands, bring on the Duke of Parma's army, take it to England, take London, get rid of Elizabeth and take over. Simple, supposedly. The English had hardly been hanging around. They may have been outnumbered and outgunned, but they did have some crucial advantages. As I've already mentioned, amphibious invasions are difficult and dangerous, and the Spanish plan relied on a complex timetable of sailing and rendezvous to succeed. Next, we've got John Hawkins. This is Elizabeth's treasurer for the Navy. He had encouraged the modernization of the Royal Navy, the Navy had skilled commanders like Drake, too. Also, the English had race-built galleons. This is a special type of warship. These were smaller than Spanish ships, but had more guns for their size. They were also fast and manoeuvrable. This meant that they could often keep out of range of Spanish guns while still doing damage, and avoid being captured and outmanoeuvred and boarded themselves. At this time, it was actually reasonably rare to sink enemy ships in combat. More often, you'd get alongside and have soldiers swing across the decks and capture them. Here we can see the design of the race-built galleon. It's at least partly inspired by hydrodynamics, or how well it moves through the water. You can see the comparison between a fish's body here and the sleek lines of the race-built galleon, built to not only crest the waves, but move through them nice and smoothly. English guns were also typically better than Spanish ones, at least for naval fighting, which would be the main part of the battle. English guns were on specialised mountings, unlike the Spanish ones. This made them quicker to reload and longer ranged. However, they had some key disadvantages too. The English only had 24 race-built galleons, 
among many other more old-fashioned and less well-armed ships. Also, the English army preparing to repel the invasion was only 4,500 militia under the command of Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. This would not be enough men to throw back a force of 27,000 trained soldiers. Essentially, the English had to make sure that that army never arrived in the first place. Stage one of three is the battle in the English Channel. The Armada approached in this crescent formation. It was sighted off Lizard Point, Cornwall on July the 19th, 1588. They sailed in this crescent formation, which would be hard to attack because if the English came up behind, the Spanish could simply surround them and board them. The English raised the alarm by lighting a series of beacons, letting Elizabeth know quickly to raise her army and prepare for an invasion, which she duly did. Then the Armada sails further up the Channel and past the waiting English fleet at Plymouth. The English fleet, though, was trapped in Plymouth by an incoming tide. You may have heard the famous story of Sir Francis Drake finishing his game of bowls whilst watching the Armada sail by. This wasn't an act of like bravery and reckless abandon. Drake was an experienced sailor. He knew that he couldn't sail against an incoming tide, so he had to wait whatever happened. However, when they finally sailed, these fast English ships soon caught up with the lumbering Armada. In a running battle up the channel, the fast English ships outmaneuvered the Spanish galleons, which could not get alongside to board them. The longer-ranged English guns fired at the Spanish. There were particular battles off the Isle of Wight, as seen here, and some damage was done. Most of all, though, the Duke of Medina Sidonia was being rushed. Despite the fighting, the English only actually captured two Spanish ships, this did reveal an important detail though. The Spanish did not have as many supplies as expected. Poor quality barrels held rotting food and ammunition stocks were already running low. This is as a result of the raid on Cadiz in 1587 and the effects of those, that raid where much of the Armada's planning was undone was still clearly being felt. Nevertheless, the Armada continued to sail up the channel and did eventually arrive off Calais where it could drop anchor and wait for the Duke of Parma's army. Disaster soon struck for the Spanish, though. The Duke of Parma's army was not yet at the coast. The Duke of Medina Sidonia had no choice but to command the Armada to drop anchor and wait off Graveline, France. The English army massed at Tilbury, waiting. It was time for the English navy to strike. Firstly, at midnight on July the 28th, the Spanish spotted flames approaching. To their horror, they realised that these were English hellburners. The English had loaded old ships with burning tar, gunpowder and loaded the cannons and set them slowly drifting towards the Spanish fleet. As day broke, the English ships attacked the Spanish ships who were scattered and disorganised by the exploding hellburners. They used their superior manoeuvrability and longer range guns to attack and damage the Spanish. The Spanish lost five ships and had to retreat north. The plan to pick up the army was no more. Their mission ruined, the defeated Spanish could not fight the winds and the tides and they retreated north to take a long route back to Spain. Later, on August the 8th, still unaware of the defeat of the Armada of Graveline, Elizabeth inspired her outnumbered army with the Tilbury speech. And this is worth dwelling on. When we consider Elizabeth as a leader, we need to remind ourselves that she is living in a very patriarchal world. Part of the problem of her not having a husband was that traditionally kings had led their armies into battle. She knew that in this world she could not do so but she could still inspire her troops. Let's have a look at her famous speech now. She said, apparently, let tyrants fear, I am come amongst you, being resolved in the midst and heat of battle to live and die amongst you all, to lay down for my God and for my kingdom and for my people, my honour and my blood, even in the dust. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, 
and a king of England too, and think foul scorn that Palmer or Spain or any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realm. You can just imagine those 4,500 militia raising their weapons up in the air and cheering. It's inspiring stuff. But she probably knew privately that if the Duke of Palmer's army did arrive, they were all done for. Luckily, they were never put to the test. So off go the Spanish Armada, sailing north to rethink things, perhaps to go back to Spain to reload and plan another invasion in a following year. However, the story doesn't just end there, and it would be unfair if we didn't recognise how Elizabeth really treated the, he the heroes of the Battle of Graveline. Despite Elizabeth's stirring words, and despite the bravery and innovation of Drake and Howard, English sailors were not rewarded. Typhus spread through the cramped and uncomfortable ships, and few men were ever paid. No way to reward the nation's saviours, eh? Stage three of the Armada is arguably the most decisive, despite the fact that the English had nothing to do with it. The defeated Spanish Armada had not yet suffered the last of its misfortunes. The winds meant that they could not take the short route back through the channel, back the way they came. Instead, they had to sail a long way, north of Scotland and west into the Atlantic. Still, they expected to get back to Spain, resupply, and try invading the following year. But that was not to be. The weather had a part to play. At this stage, a violent summer storm blew up over the Atlantic. Sailing was hazardous at the best of times in the 16th century, but many of the Armada's ships had left their anchors back at Graveline in the panic to escape the fire ships. They were powerless to resist being blown onto deadly rocks of Western Ireland and Scotland. Of the 170 ships that sent out, only 67 returned. The Spanish lost around 20,000 men in the failed invasion, would actually never succeed in conquering England, and peace was agreed in 1604, after Elizabeth's death, and very much after this course finishes. But the tattered remnants of the Spanish struggled on. At least the storm finished suddenly there. This is the origin of the phrase at the top, God blew and they were scattered. This was put on a commemorative medallion that Elizabeth had commissioned. And many of the English did see it as God's doing that the Spanish had tried to invade, but ultimately been wrecked by a storm. But could they really claim victory for this? Let's consider the main reasons why the Armada failed. Firstly, the English had several advantages. Drake, Howard and Hawkins were skilled commanders with excellent ships, though in truth they only had small numbers of the most modern race-built galleons. Despite inflicting little damage in the dash up the channel, they had rushed the Duke of Medina Sidonia so that the rendezvous with Palmer failed. The English use of fire ships off Calais and their victory at Graveline thwarted any Spanish hopes of invading that year. And that's linked to poor Spanish planning too. The need to link up with the Duke of Parma was a big weakness. Without a port lock like Ostend to load men, this would take a long time to complete. Messages between the Duke of Medina Sidonia and the Duke of Parma were slow and unreliable, having to go by sea. Word of the Armada's arrival got to Parma too late. And then we've got to consider the role of Philip of Spain versus the role of Elizabeth. On the one hand, Philip took personal interest in the planning and command of the Armada. He often ignored the advice of his commanders. Elizabeth, though, knew that she had very little military experience. So what she did, it was do her best to inspire her troops, but left the military decisions to the experts. Finally, we've got chance circumstances. The vast majority of Spain's losses were a result of the storm that hit them as the ships sailed home. However, other factors may be more or less to chance, depending on your point of view. Preparations had been affected by Drake's raid on Cadiz in 1587. The Duke of Parma's failure to capture the port of Ostend made an already complex rendezvous plan even more difficult. And also, we've got to consider that the Armada was only caught in that deadly storm because of the failure of their plan, and that put them in the wrong place at the wrong time, often with damaged vessels who had cut loose their anchors in the panic to escape the fire ships. So, chance, yes, nobody controlled the weather, the Armada was unlucky. But maybe the English would argue, you make your own luck. The propaganda value of the victory was huge for Elizabeth. Indeed, a really famous portrait was commissioned, the Armada portrait. Let's have a look at some of the key features and what they mean. 
On one pillar behind her, we can see the English fleet looking all magnificent and in broad daylight. Compare that to the wrecked Spanish Armada as it's smashed against the rocks of Ireland and Scotland in a storm. We can see that Elizabeth has got the crown here, symbolic perhaps of her royal power being undimmed. Her hand, rather provocatively, is resting on the new world. Perhaps Elizabeth is now saying to Spain, you're going to be challenged in the new world. England has ambitions for an empire of its own, as we'll look at in future videos. And aside from her rather glorious appearance here, we've also got a mermaid in the corner. People at the time would have understood that mermaids were not only female, but they were also very cunning and very good at luring people for, to their deaths, particularly sailors. Is this Elizabeth's way of saying that that is precisely what she had done? She had provoked Philip II to try and invade her, and in doing so, he had been wrecked. Well, let's be truthful here. Elizabeth had actually spent a quite a long time trying to avoid war with Spain, so maybe that's unlikely. But it's a nice message for the English to have a look at, as a propaganda message at least. That brings us rather neatly onto the outcomes. Let's start with England. The victory was a great propaganda triumph for Elizabeth. A painting and commemorative medal were made to mark the event. Elizabeth's popularity increased. Hawkins, and especially Drake, became celebrated national heroes. The English argued that it was a sign God favoured Protestantism. The Anglo-Dutch alliance was strengthened. Having defeated a more powerful enemy, the English had a new sense of national pride, and English naval power had grown in reputation. Victory gave England the confidence to go out and explore, trade, and arguably eventually found colonies and an empire, although that would happen later. Although, and I feel I should mention this, we should mention the English counter-armada of 1589. This was a humiliating failure, but English propagandists have succeeded in minimising its effect on English confidence going forward and histories today. So I only felt a duty to tell you, because otherwise someone in the comments would probably put it down anyway. What about the outcomes for Spain? Defeating the Armada was a significant blow to the pride of both Spain and their monarch, Philip II. The Spanish found that the Dutch rebels' determination to fight was renewed. The Armada had a serious financial and military cost. Some historians pinpoint it as the start of the long, slow decline of Spanish power and influence. However, the impact should not be exaggerated. The way that Spain defeated the counter-armada the following year shows that they were hardly defeated. The armada was a setback, not a decisive defeat. So the Spanish victory over the English counter-armada shows that Spain was still immensely powerful, far more powerful than England in fairness. Also, Philip's faith in Catholicism was in no way shaken. He continued to be determined to fight for the true religion as he saw it. At long last, let's summarise with our final points. Consider this interpretation in a 400th anniversary article in History Today magazine. This was written in 1988, Why the Armada Failed. Philip II was not an, only an armchair strategist, but an armchair tactician too. But what it means by that is it refers to military commanders who think they know what they're doing from home, but don't really have a good grasp of the realities on the front line. Anyway, the final version of his plans depended for success upon a tactical edge which Spain's ships simply did not possess. In this disharmony between strategy and tactics, therefore, lies the true explanation of the Armada's fate. Well, can we agree with this? I'm sure there's plenty of you will disagree, and if you do, please pop it down in the comments below. Or, if you do agree, say why. But consider the following. Spain wanted to invade England for a variety of military, political and religious reasons. But it failed because... The Spanish failed to rendezvous with their army in the Netherlands and had other faults with their planning and communications. English ships and tactics successfully disrupted Spain's plans. A storm wrecked many Spanish ships during the return voyage. So the outcomes were significant. England felt a new pride in its fleet, queen and confidence in its place in the world. Spain had suffered a reversal, but it would continue to be strong. Let's not exaggerate things. So bearing all these things in mind, and the very many things that we've discussed in this video, do the events of this at the Armada support the interpretation? As I say, you've got comments below where you can make your voice heard. I have in the past released videos on the Spanish Armada and come in for some real criticism from Spanish viewers. Look, I'm bound to look at things from a British perspective, and indeed this course is written from this perspective as well. But it was a victory for the English because it did prevent the Spanish from invading.
But that's not to ignore the fact that England was still very junior in power compared to Spain, as only showed by the counter armada a year later. But that's the end of this video, probably the longest rapid revision, or so-called rapid, that I'll ever make. I hope it's still been useful to you and that you've enjoyed it. If you have, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I'll say thank you very much for your patience and for watching. Goodbye.